Good afternoon. I hope everybody had a nice lunch and we can start with the, the afternoon session. So exosomes have been, at least in the science press, a lot and they've been getting a lot of buzz. And it's, it's, not, it's not surprising because it seems, it seems like exosomes do everything. So in very respected journals, you do see headlines like these highly purified vesicles alleviate aging. That's pretty amazing. But if you read the details of the paper, they are looking at the reduction of uh, um, uh, oxygen radicals. It, it, do, it doesn't mean that grandmom looks like she's 30 again. But it, it, that is a, quite a strong claim to make. Exosomes, uh, multiple papers have been published that they look very promising for wound healing. In this case, part of their contents, a micro -R RNA, the one specifically is 2138, it promotes blood vessel formation and uh, fibroblast function. So you can see obviously that, that could be very important for wound healing. Another paper showing that wound healing, uh, the exosomes facilitate this by promoting collagen synthesis and angiogenesis again. Okay. These exosomes are isolated from a variety of different uh, cells, in this case uh, mesenchymal stem cell cultures. <coughs> exosomes for cell survival. So in this case, um, kidney cells were treated with cisplatin, which is very toxic, and it reduced the amount of apoptosis, or programmed cell death, both in a DISH and in in vivo mouse studies. So a lot of people are thinking, what are these exosomes and where can I get some? In fact, it seems like it's a new therapeutic paradigm. Um, there are some very good review articles that kind of explain the biology and the background of, of exosomes in uh, more detail. So what are exosomes? And I think first of all we should take a step back. Exosomes come from cells. They are not cells themselves. They, they are little buds or particles that, um, that um, bud off. But first of all, let's start with the cell, the smallest unit of life, the building block of everything. Cells have lots of jobs and lots of ways that they affect uh, health. One thing that they do is they secrete things like ex extra extracellular matrix, things like collagen, hyaluronic acid, elastin. Uh, these are particularly important for wound healing and cosmetic purposes, but also this is kind of the, the basement membrane or the glue that holds our tissues together and make things look, gives them structural and health, healthy, gives the tissue strength and um, uh, makes the tissue strong and healthy. Cells do a lot of communication between themselves. They can contact each other. Cells transmit information between themselves by, by being in close contact and actually touching each other. We, we know they secrete growth factors, cytokines, anti-inflammatories. These can work very locally or they can work at a distance. The other way that cells can communicate is to bud off little vesicles or uh, little buds of membrane with, with different types of information inside of them. And they're commonly referred to as exosomes, these little buds that, that branch off. So exosomes, you'll see them re referred to as microvesicles or extracellular vesicles or EVs. There are some small differences. Uh, the size exosomes are, I think, typically about a hundred nanometers. Microvesicles might be between 100 and 200. 
There's some small differences about how they emerge from the cell, but I don't think those differences are, are really important. But they're formed by blebbing off of the cell membrane. But before they pinch off, they're packed with different molecules, proteins, uh, microRNAs. They're enriched for certain lipids and certain, and certain proteins that are very characteristic to exosomes. Um, and many of these have signaling or communication functions. So this work originally arose from work on platelets or red blood cells. Anytime you grow cells in culture, there's debris, little fragments. So somebody was actually studying this very specifically, how this process happens. And they decided it's more than just dandruff. These, these exosomes actually have uh, an important function. So like all breakthroughs, it didn't happen overnight. This was probably cooking, this was cooking away in, in people's labs for the last 20 years, but having a fuller understanding of this has really only been in the last few years. So exosomes very much reflect the parent cell that they come from. But there are some components that are common and characteristic to all exosomes. So basically, exosomes are, are, are little vehicles, thousands of times smaller than a cell, that are used to transfer bioactive cargo. And you just kind of have this basket or umbrella term of bioactive cargo because it encompasses proteins, lipids, and different types of nucleic acids. So some of these proteins that are found on almost all species of exosomes would include transport proteins. So once an exosome has fused with a cell, the cell would then be endowed with the capability to transport small molecules or you know, even a whole receptor. And it gives it this ability to respond to you know, the external environment, whether it's a calcium flux or whether it's the presence of a growth factor. It can now respond to it because it has received a, a, a structure from the exosome. GTPases are a very common content of exosomes. These are often cofactors for receptor activation. So the recipient cell has, you know, an FGF receptor, a you know, EGF receptor, whatever, but many of these receptors also require small molecules for activation. And GTP in itself is, is a cofactor uh, co for signal transduction within the cell. Exosomes also have a lot of heat shock proteins. So heat shock proteins are kind of named um, kind of a, in a historical way because it was discovered that if you took a perfectly healthy batch of cells and heated it to let's say 40 degrees centigrade, 42 degrees centigrade, you would start seeing these uh, an abundance of these new proteins of, you know, specific molecular weights, uh, 7 kilodaltons, 90 kilodaltons, and they were called heat shock proteins reflecting that, oh, they only arose after the cell had been really challenged at an abnormally high temperature. But what their role in vivo is, is they help fold proteins fold normally. You have this long string of, uh, of amino acids coming off the ribosome, and to form that perfect you know, three-dimensional structure, it, some degree it's just um, reduction of steric hindrances, putting the hydrophilic amino acids on the outside, the hydrophobic ones on the inside, but they also get help from heat shock proteins. The tetraspanins are characteristic of exosomes and their function is not really well known. So some of the lipids that are very characteristic in exosomes, some of them are common to just about every cell membrane in the body. Like most membranes have sphingomyelin. It's very rich in neural cells. Um, 
And as far as we know, it's, it's just a structural lipid. But other lipids are sing signaling lipids, things like phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylinositol. There are receptors that require these as cofactors for activation. One thing that's quite striking is the variety of nucleic acids that are packed inside of exosomes. There's messenger RNA that can be translated into protein. But there's also a very rich variety of non-coding RNAs. So they don't code for protein, but they regulate the expression of protein. These nucleic acids are not incorporated into the genome. They do not enter the nucleus. They are not making a change in the genome. They live for a fairly short time in the, the, the cytoplasm and can up-regulate or down-regulate um, uh, other messenger RNAs, protein synthesis, etc. So to emphasize, and this is the important difference, is exosomes really reflect the cell that they came from, the parent cell. So if you look at the exosomes from a culture of mesenchymal stem cells, it will be quite distinguishable from the exosomes that you find in plasma. People are very excited about using exosomes for diagnosis because cancer cells shed characteristic exosomes. So these could be used for, for uh, diagnostic purposes. We even say with, is, have seen, even within a specific cell type, that a lot of factors will affect the contents of the exosomes. Age, gender, disease state, fasting or fed, uh, and uh, medic, uh, the various medications will affect the contents of exosomes. A tremendous amount is being published right now, and people are trying to document the contents, how they differ from various, various cells, various disease states, uh, different patients. To date, there's over 900 proteins been identified that are essentially, that, that are characteristic of exosomes, over 200 messenger RNAs, and 200 microRNAs. Some of these overlap, and some of them are quite distinctive to a particular um, uh, exosome family, the parent cell and the exosomes that it, it gives rise to. So let's take an example of how these exosomes might work. So we have a healthy stem cell in the center of this illustration. Okay, and we have four injured cells surrounding it. So there are a number of different ways that the exosomes from the healthy stem cell could help the injured cell. One is direct stimulation. So exosomes can be filled with growth factors. So the exosomes, part of their contents would be, um, you know, a, a, a um, could be a growth factor or a cytokine this could help the injured cell recover and repair. It can transfer genetic information in the form of messenger RNA or microRNAs and give this cell new capabilities to overcome the, the injury that it's received. It can also deliver proteins, things like the heat shock proteins. And I think this may be very interesting with uh, heat shock proteins, for instance. A lot of neurodegenerative uh, diseases have a component of tangled or misfolded proteins. So could these heat shock proteins being delivered by exosomes uh, improve that, that clinical picture. We don't know, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Or exosomes can have a specific receptor on their surface, EGF, PDGF. Once it fuses with the recipient cell, that, that injured cell now has the capability to respond to a growth factor that it was previously unable to respond to. OK, 
Okay. So it's, it's quite clear that exosomes can work locally to an adjacent or nearby cell, or they can enter the circulation and work at a distant location. There's, the, the literature is just exploding with documentation, mostly in culture or in animal models, but some species of exosomes can home to a site of injury, and this has been shown in, in a mouse model, but not in humans. They're able to remodel the extracellular matrix, and part of that, it might have uh, the, uh, um, the tissue uh, met metalloproteases or protease inhibitors as cargo and remodel the, extras the extracellular matrix. They're able to modulate cell growth both positively and negatively. They can modulate inflammation typically by communicating with immune cells. They can modulate cell mobility and sometimes this is a direct effect or sometimes it's an indirect effect. For instance, if they remodel the extracellular matrix, uh, something like a macrophage entering the environment might be more, um, it would be a better environment for it to become resident there. Or if it remodeled differently, the cell would be like, okay, see you later, I'm off to work elsewhere. Exosomes can also change vascular permeability. So I don't think every exosome can do all of these jobs. It depends very much on the parent cell from which they, um, they arise. The parent cell is also responding to the local environment. Um, is it an injury environment? Is it a growth environment? Um, just giving the, the organism uh, more flexibility in how to respond. Okay, so the thought is coming together that um, exosomes are extensions of their parent cell's biological roles. And the, the exosomes have been most extensively studied in cultures of mesenchymal stem cells. So these are cell, the mesenchymal stem cells, of course, are of great interest. They're very easy to study in the lab. So it's very easy to culture them and then and analyze these um, exosomes. You can also grow um, large quantities of mesenchymal cells. They have something called a cell factory. So instead of a, a flask of cell, it's a stacked layer, a stack of flasks, and sometimes it just has a permeable membrane rather than a rigid plastic so that um, it increases the surface space that you're growing the cells on, you know, hundreds or even thousands of fold. So you can grow a large number of, of cells and harvest the media into which the exosomes have been uh, uh, secreted into. So MSCs, as you know, have a, a generated a, a, a lot of interest and uh, we know that they can affect cell replication by the growth factors that they secrete. They can improve cell survival by secreting anti-apoptotic molecules. We know MSCs can downregulate an overactive immune response. MSCs are also able to home to sites of injury, uh, and they're also able to remodel the extracellular matrix. So this really seems like the exosomes are mimicking, or can, or an extension of the parent cell, that the mesenchymal cells. Uh, the exosomes are extending the role of MSCs. And this might explain a lot of things that kind of just were difficult to make sense of. So we know that MSCs, they can work at a distance. They may be transplanted into one location, but other joints in the body may uh, have some benefit. Well, it's not because the MSCs are moving. It's the secretion of the exosomes that may that may um, affect the change. 
Also, MSCs, you know, have over the years they've been reported to have a, a variety of different potential benefits, actually a rather remarkable array of benefits. And this may in fact be a reflection of the exosomes. This is all kind of beginning to, to um, emerge from the literature and is a very active area of, of research. Now why would you want to get exosomes from a cell culture umbilical mesenchymal stem cell culture, uh, bone marrow mesenchymal cell culture. Why don't you just rely on your own exosomes? Well, as we as we we know that cells age as we do. I would. It's been clear that the exosomes from a you know a two-year-old mouse are a lot different than a six-week-old mouse or the exosomes from a 60 year old are a lot different than the exosomes from a, a, a six year old. So uh, it's likely that the quality and quanti quantity of exosomes is, is not as, as rich in an, in an older person than a younger person. The older cells may not have the same uh, release and repair mechanisms that exosomes from a, a young cell may have. And you know, and, and with growth and disease situations, it's going to change the contents of the exosomes. Just as that we see that exosomes from a cancerous cell reflect the cancerous state. The, the exosome from healthy cell lines or cells with a uh, regenerative capacity are going to reflect the capabilities of the um, the cells that they came from. Okay, so I, my colleague was kind enough to share some proprietary information with me about their development of an exosome product for skin rejuvenation. It's exosomes. I'm sure will have many clinical uh, applications, but we have to kind of go through them one by one. Skin rejuvenation is a fairly easy topic to research because it's very accessible, it's not invasive, and it's, it's um, fairly easy to evaluate uh, the results. But in order to formulate exosomes that would be particularly good for skin rejuvenation, they had to go through several steps. First of all, they had to think about what would their ideal exosome be? What would the contents of that exosome have in it? Then they had to screen a variety of cell lines to find an exosomes that had those characteristics. Once they had done that, they had to scale up and be able to make in commercial quantities uh, exosomes. And then they had to do this the standard quality control, quality assurance that it should do for every cell to characterize what they were planning to market. So it's it's kind of interesting to point out. I the FDA has not really said anything about exosomes yet. It's too new. But I think they're going to be quite favorably disposed to them because these are not living cells. They don't have a nucleus. They're not going to have mutations. They can't form a tumor. Because their composition is fairly simple, they don't have as many different cell surface markers as our cells. It's a relatively limited rep repertoire. They do not have the same immunogenicity that a cell would have. They also have the advantage that they're just more stable. And I know some companies are playing around with freeze drying this product so it could be stored on the shelf uh, rather than, than freezing it. But they do freeze and thaw very well. Freeze drying will be kind of the, the ne uh, a next step that we haven't, we're not sure about yet, but it should work. So they thought, okay, what do we need from these exosomes to have a product that, that we really like and is, is, is going to work well? So th things that were obvious is they wanted exosomes that had lots of collagen, type 1 and type 3, hyaluronic acid, and chondroitin sulfate. 
they also felt that a variety of growth factors would be very good for, for skin rejuvenation. Things like FGF, SCF, and, and VEGF. So this was kind of their perfect product that they envisioned in, the, in their minds. So the first thing that they did that they felt was essential for success was look at the growth factors. That's fairly straightforward to do. And this writing is very small, I apologize, but there are a series of cell lines derived from the umbilical cord lining, which they cultured to basically be a, a, a mesenchymal cell line, and bone marrow mesenchymal cells. So they had, you know, here they have lines, uh, you know, there were many. There was probably about 30 of each, and this is just some representative results. So for the stem cell factor, all of the umbilical cord cultures secreted uh, significant amounts, while none of the bone marrow cultures uh, had, you know, quite a bit less. The VEGF was more uh, more widely expressed, not in all of the bone marrow stromal cultures, but in some of them. But going forward, they selected to work with the um, umbilical cord stromal cultures, just to narrow things down a bit. Okay, something that they also wanted to see in the product was getting the highest amount of hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate. So they cultured uh, the cells, they tried different types of media because that's also going to affect what the cells secrete and the contents of the exosomes. So at this point they're also refining the media that the cells will grow and secrete the, ex the exosomes into this media to make it a conditioned media rich in exosomes. So they found that their U3 media was, was the best. Another thing that they wanted to, they had to test was, okay, now we have to isolate the exosomes. And something very important for the skincare product was an abundance of collagen. So after optimizing the cell line, the media, the way that they'd be cultured, they had to work out an isolation process where they would get the best yield of exosomes and optimizing, one of the factors opti they optimized for was, was collagen content. So kind of a overall uh, view of this product was that they can define how much collagen it has, how much hyaluronic acid, the chondroitin sulfate, and a variety of the, the growth factors. So this is, a, this, you know, I'm flipping through it in four slides, but this is probably about three years of work. And they're not on the market yet. They're getting there. So um, exosomes are not easy to isolate. So you have the cells in culture, you have these huge stacks because uh, these cells will not grow free floating in culture like a leukemia, a, a, you know, a blood cell or a leukemic cell would do. They need to be on a, on a, a solid surface. Exosomes bud off from the cell and you can, there's a representation of, of the exosome. If you look at it under the electron microscope, you can see that it's, it's not just like broken bits of cells, they actually are quite uniform in appearance. This takes a variety of centrifugations. In, in the research scale, typically what would be done is you spin it fairly low speed to get rid of any cells, you spin it a bit harder to get rid of cell debris, the larger particles. You then spin it at 100,000 times G. So this is like a really incredibly strong um, centrifugal force. I think we once figured that if the ultra centrifuge, if that rotor broke out of the centrifuge, it would fly to Boston to New Hampshire and take out any walls in the way, no problem. And, and it's a next centrifugation step, they are put on uh, a dense sucrose solution. So the exosomes are more buoyant than just 
like dead debris that has no uh, functional value. So this is great for a research scale, but, but industry has had to, to gear up because there's no way that you could uh, collect enough exosomes for therapy using the, this di differential centrifugation. So they have their tricks. Um, there's a, um, a um, I'm trying to remember the name of the technique, but it's um, diffusion through a small membrane, but with an active uh, pumping and pressure that allows you to, to remove uh, much of the unwanted materials and, and concentrate the exosomes. But once you, have, once you have a product and you're selling it, buyer beware, how do you know that you're really being sold exosomes? They're hard to isolate and they're hard to, to measure or quantify. They're so, they're so tiny that you can use an electron microscope, which are about like half a million dollars. There's a specialized machine that does nothing but count exosomes and it does it by looking at the molecular Brownian motion of these small particles. But it's very expensive and that's the only thing that it does. It's not like a microscope that you can use for a variety of different evaluations. There are a number of indirect ways to, to measure exosomes. They're way too small to be seen by standard flow cytometry. So the trick is you have to have a bead that's about the size of a cell and put an antibody on it that recognizes an exosome specific protein. So the bead that's the exosome can be tethered to an antibody that's anchored to a bead. So you're detecting the exosomes indirectly. Western blotting will show if you have those characteristic proteins. And you should probably look at more than one because some of them are higher or lower on a different species of exosome depending on what cell type they are, uh, arise from. Another indirect assay would be uh, ELISA to recognize these uh, exosome specific proteins. Okay. So the kind of data that I would like to see if I was purchasing an exosome product, um, well, not necessarily electron microscopy data, but these very, very small particles uh, marked by arrows show the exosomes. It's not this large bleb. This is like a, like a cellular equivalent of a piece of dandruff or something. But <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll hope it's not a, a, a bacteria or something. But these very, very small particles are the exosomes. So you can do a Western blot running the, all the proteins on a gel and then transferring the gel to a solid support and then coating that support with a specific antibody to an exosome specific product. So this, this does have uh, CD44. And you know it because uh, you have an antibody that's been tested to be specific and the protein is at the correct molecular weight. So CD44 should have a molecular weight of 84 kilodaltons. And let's see, this is really small writing. Oh, okay, so once they isolated their pure pellet of, of exosomes after centrifugation, they looked at the amount of protein it had and the amount of RNA that it had. This is actually a pretty extreme ratio. Most cells have, you know, uh, you know, a million cells would probably give you a, you know, a microgram of protein, but it's only going to give you nanograms of RNA. In exosomes, the RNA to protein ratio is, is a lot closer. So if, if you're thinking about buying an exosome product, and I really hope that the, the market does not take a wrong turn here and people are selling little vials of, of dried uh, uh, serum albumin that has actually very few exosomes in it, but I would ask, how are these exosomes isolated? What cell type did they come from? Why did you choose to use that particular cell type to isolate 
exosomes from? What qualities or properties are you looking for? And again, what quality systems do you have for that manufacturing process? How is the quality controlled? What evaluations or analyses are they doing? How are they monitoring the lab environment to make sure that this is a, a safe and pure product? Okay, so if I had a crystal ball and, and could predict what we're going to see in the next few years, I think exosomes will enter the market fairly rapidly for cosmetics and hair restoration. I think wound care is uh, something that will, will move forward quickly. And I think we'll see a lot of diagnostic applications. I think other clinical applications, things like an anti-aging treatment, um, uh, helping regenerate and restore a damaged kidney or a damaged liver. There's really tantalizing data from mouse models, muscle regeneration, uh, things like if, if you've had a, um, you've heart. Exos exosome treatments do seem to be, to be helpful, but again, this is, we're still in the early stages of the game here. But hopefully developing these, these less, you know, um, these, developing these other applications will help us build the technology, build better ways to isolate and purify these products, and bring it to market at hopefully more affordable rates than, than what it, it costs to do right now. So if you have any questions about exosomes, I will, I will try my best to, to answer, but, but hopefully we've uh, gotten the main point that exosomes are acellular. They do not make genetic changes in the cells that they fuse with, and that we're, it's very exciting, but I think we're in the very early stage of, of this game.